Welcome to another episode of Good Sugar. I am Ralph Sutton. As always, it's Marcus and Tebby with me. Good Sugar is the show where we find the good and the bad, the bad and the good in different aspects of health and wellness. Uh, it's also a journey of mine where I'm trying to become a better person, both mentally and physically, Marcus. Uh, thanks for that introduction. I just want to warn you and the audience that I'm waiting for my uh, smoothie bowl to come into the room and I'm starving. So I'm going to be dabbling on it probably when we have a guest on the show. I'm sorry about that. The way, the way timing works in the world, I'm sure it'll happen as soon as the guest arrives. Um, I'm going to read you just a quick, Ralph, I'll give you a quick update first. Uh, I've been running more and more. I have over 200 miles logged as running, which is pretty crazy at this point. Um, I did my fastest run ever. I wanted to see if I could do uh, a mile under 10 minutes and I was able to do it, which is for me unbelievable to think I could do that where I was normally running like 15 minute miles. So that's 50% faster, quite honestly, if that's right by math. Um, haven't missed a run, sticking with it. And I think it definitely helped me mentally. I, I did write a few things. You look good. You look, I mean, even though you're dark and we can't see, it looks can like I, I, I can see. This light is out, but I don't know if you can see this right here. I clock. can see the difference though. Oh, can you see that little scar? I hit myself in the head. So fucking annoying. Excuse my language, but because I'm 6'6", six, six, I was getting up at a table, one of these outside table things, and just right on the corner of something, and it started bleeding. Really ruined the date, just in case you're wondering. <laughs> and I'm going to read you what I wrote that day, because it pissed me off. I said, I'm pretty sure I'm going to die before most of my friends and my brother, as I've never seen a single man over the age of 70 who's taller than 5'11". Just like bigger dogs live shorter lives, bigger people do as well. And it's become a little depressing to realize maybe I only got about 20 years left in my life. Oh, my God. And I've been uh, wondering if I'm not enjoying my life enough. I seem to be so focused on work and money. I wonder that if by the time I achieve the goals I've set for myself, how many years left will I actually have to enjoy them? That's a beautiful writing. You know, first of all, I, wanna, I, I have to comment on this one. Well, that's you know, why I said it, Marcus. We don't know what those taller guys were eating and their lifestyle. And I, I, guar I guarantee you... Not I guarantee you we can go online and find a lot of people who are your size that live a very, very, very long time. Well, just like, you know, a Great Dane lives like 9, 10 years, and a little Yorkie lives like 15 or 20. It's just the nature of the beast. That's what it is. Uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not sure about the science. You know, I don't know that relating it to the, is, is, it's the same thing. I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I've also looked into it with like. So you, what are you saying that me at five foot eight and and one quarter inch that I'm biologically superior to you? Yes, well, a few reasons. Um, so that I, means all the humiliation I've had these years when you called me tiny shrimp, shorty, and you would you call me nugget one time? You called me midget dwarf, and what was the thing. other name? Uh, asshole. No, you called me stubby. stubby. So all that humiliation is coming back. I'm going to call you soon to be dead man. <laughs> I was going to say short lifespan, man. <laughs> <laughs> I had another one here, and this is going to tie in perfectly with our guest. But what's the cutoff height? I, I don't know. It's a good question. That's so, good. like, like Brian, what are you, Brian, are you 6'3? I think Brian is about 6'3. Yeah. I am. Yeah, that's, so our, Brian, that's our okay. uh, engineer, our producer. Brian's 6'3. Okay. So, the cutoff height is 6'3 and a quarter. If you're, if you're below 6'3 <laughs> and a quarter, you have regular longevity, just like the rest of us. Above that, you got problems. You got problems. Um, our, our guest today is going to be Dr. William Lee, who's a leader in uh, diet and what he call it's called uh, angiogenesis. And I've watched some great TED Talks with him. And he has a book out that's all about uh, eating right and being healthy. And I'm excited. You know, I had a um, very short time to do research on this guy and I couldn't pick up everything, but it sounds like he's really an epic guy who... I would probably bet that we're totally in alignment and I really can't wait to hear a doctor, a spouse, the lifestyle that um, I've been talking about, writing about for years. Because it's rare for you, if I'm not mistaken, that very often your methodology or your belief system is challenged by those in the medical field because you either A, you're not a doctor so they automatically poo-poo you or B, it goes against the whole big pharma medicine money-making machine. Nah, it's true. You know, the, you, when you approach a doctor, you have to approach them like a certain type of beast, right? You know, I read this really interesting paper called Academic Snobbery. It was written by these professors in Australia. And I thought it was so amazing that I reached out to them by email and I asked them if I could make it into a little 
um, publication that I'm going to put into the Good Sugar Library because it really segues into understanding how people think that it's the guy with the diploma or the guy with the title that he's the genius and everyone else is not. And that is a mistake. Right, just like, by the way, those that go to uh, music school, it doesn't mean they're any more talented than someone that's ta self-taught. The self-taught ones are generally sometimes even way better. Right. And so what you have to look at is, is basically is understand that we're on the same team if you're in the health and wellness business and you have to really to be great at what they do, which is charge people money for health tips, savior, nutrition, whatever they're doing. To be great at that, you really have to have 10 books open at one time and you have to continue to learn. Right. And there's people who have that personality that they're fascinated by knowledge and not by, let's say, having an attachment to a particular piece of knowledge that gives them credibility. Oh, well, we always got to push forward. That's the thing. You got to push yeah. forward. Yeah. Well, it's difficult uh, when, when somebody, when somebody doesn't matter who they're a doctor, when someone actually writes a book or puts out a supplement, they have to believe in that thing. They, they, there's a, there's a corruption that happens for all of us. You know, even me, I'm in the food business. If I'm in the juice business, I'm going to push and promote juice. Right. And so, course. you know, that, that's, where, that's where you really have to do, always just say, buyer beware. Uh, the thing that I found fascinating about this doctor is that he rides the, the, the rail between the food science and the science science of like, you know, he's been involved with developing medicines too. Usually most of the people we've encountered on the show or I've encountered in life really are one or the other, like 100% all natural, just feed your diet and stuff. And then the people that believe solely in medicine and that that so this is kind of in alignment with what you believe in which is sometimes you may need a, a doctor but most problems can be fixed through the right diet and the right awareness of it really depends on the individual you know as i as i say uh you know as i was taught you know uh the body can heal itself to the point where the body cannot heal itself and then you need intervention of That's some a, kind like and, running rubbing blueberries on his arm that he just lost and well like, yeah if you're in a car accident you don't pour carrot juice on it okay so we've talked about it long enough let's bring him on right now dr william lee thank you so much for joining us on the show how are you i'm, I'm well thank you for having me you already look very distinguished and much more smarter or more intelligent or well versed in what we're about to talk about than i maybe not marcus but definitely than i so before we get into anything, this is a very interesting, perfect timing thing that I didn't set up, but Marcus is eating a bowl of, an acai bowl sort of thing. Can you explain what's in it, Marcus? Because I heard Dr. Lee say something that I would find, want to hear. Avocado, blueberry. Sarah, start again, Marcus. It's uh, blended uh, banana, blueberry, avocado. Mm -hmm two different superfood powders, homemade oat milk, and uh, some granola, sugar-free granola, no processed ingredients. Okay, so now, Mar um, Dr. Lee, I heard you say on a show, on one of these seminars, I watched as much as I could, I wish I knew you were coming, we didn't know until yesterday, because I would have read your book in its entirety, but I did a, you know, top-down, as far as I could go, uh, intro to, to you and angiogenesis and all that other stuff, but one of the things you said, and maybe I'm taking it out of context, that there probably is no such thing as superfoods. Well, so listen, I'm a medical doctor, I'm a research scientist, and I wrote a book. And the reason I wrote the book really is because I spent 25 years working in uh, biotech, really, to try to come up with new solutions for disease. And I know how hard it is to develop new treatments. And so when I heard about superfoods, you know, just like everyone else did, I just thought, you know, man, that's way too easy to come up, you know, with this slogan that says one food magic bullet will do it all. I love and this guy. I love this guy. So the, 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 truth, the truth is that um, we're just at the beginning of figuring out exactly what Mother Nature laced in her foods that are good for us. So, for example, Marcus, you're eating blueberries. I can tell you that one of the things that blueberries does, it's got a natural dye that gives us this natural purple color. It activates our body's immune system, which is one of our body's five health defense systems, which is good to protect us against cancer and COVID and other things as well. And it turns out that even when you exercise, um, our immune system ramps up uh, and blueberries help it keep 
aloft, you know, it kind of keeps your immune system kind of boosted up. And so while, you know, so back to your question, Ralph, so is that a superfood? Nope. Actually, it's, it's really our super bodies that are responding to what we put inside it. Okay, fair enough. So then, Marcus wow, wow. Well, first of all, oh, we lost Marcus. God damn it, Marcus. Get better internet. Goes to you, doctor, because I'm not a doctor. I'm a retail merchant who's been in the game for a long time. And when I started uh, a chain of juice bars in New York in 2010, I don't know if you know my background, I got into the business right at the height where everybody was using the word superfood. And I laughed because, first of all, I know that it's not a medical terminology. It's an industry terminology that's either in the nutraceutical industry or the smoothie bar industry, so to speak. And really what they do in the West is they take any exotic fruit that's coming from Asia or from South America that we never heard before, maca and cacao or blueberry or dragon fruit or whatever, camu camu, and superfood just sounds a lot more exciting. <clears throat> The truth is, there is a thing called a superfood. It just really, um, it is relative to who's talking because I would imagine someone who hasn't eaten any food in three days and they're, they're crawling across the desert floor, we could say that a Twinkie is a superfood because, man, do they need it. So it's definitely a buzzword and it confuses a lot of people as much as the word um, adaptogen. I'm sure there's another one of your favorite words out there. But I'm really interested in what you have to say. Thank you. Well, let me ask you this then just really quickly. Then I want to get into the book and some things that I read about. But then why, Marcus, do you say that I have two superfood powders if you don't believe in it? It's not that I don't believe in it. I'm just calling it a – it's like a – it's a buzzword. If you, if, if you look at the stuff I write on my website, there's, I have an article about the word superfood. My, my, fav, my, my least favorite words – on both sides of the aisle. I don't like when doctors, no offense, when they mystify things. Like, for example, with all due respect, when doctors say, we're just figuring out, I laugh because you guys are catching up finally to what is already known by certain indigenous people for generations. Not everybody, obviously, because you know people have been making food mistakes since about 9,000 years ago. It's really where it started. Some guy got slapped in the face. That was me. I was the first guy to say, yeah. well, I need it. Um, so let me, I, I, you know, your book, uh, Eat to Beat Disease, and then I watched your TED Talk, Can We Eat to Starve Cancer? And I wow. have a bunch of questions, right? So a lot of your work, obviously, is in angiogenesis, which is, uh, you're also the director of the foundation as well, right? Um, and there's this talk, a lot of it is about food that are, anti-angiogenesis or gen genesistic, I guess is the right word. I don't know. But, and then there's food that is pro like to inhibit or, and you know, the idea being that uh, angiogenesis is the process of which new blood vessels are formed from existing blood vessels. Correct. That's so right. how does one know if they are in a deficient or a excessive state of angiogenesis? You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. Too much or not enough blood vessels? Because according to your research, you eat different things for different things. Right. Well, so here's, let me try to simplify it. Uh, basically, our body knows exactly how much it needs of virtually everything. Our body naturally knows how much immunity we need. And that's basically why we don't get sick more often from colds and things like that. Our body knows exactly how many blood vessels it needs in order for our own circulation to be performing where it should be. And, and how, our blood, or how, how our circulation grows is really how blood vessels grow. That's angiogenesis. So, you know, when we're born... We're born with all the blood vessels we need. They actually stretch and they accommodate. Like we're working out, we actually get more blood vessels to accommodate bigger muscles. Um, and by the way, the average person doesn't know this, but there's 60,000 miles worth of blood vessels that are crammed under our skin and into I our bodies. I know it now because I watched all of your uh, talks and it goes around the earth twice, if I'm not mistaken. Exactly. And so you got to think about this is the, the highways and byways you know, sort of the Amazons down to the little trickling streams uh, that brings everything, all of our nutrients and all of our nutrition and what we eat, what we breathe, our oxygen, it's a feed everything. So that's really good. We want to keep angiogenesis. We want to keep our blood vessels growing the way they need to grow. Um, and actually exercise, good sleep, um, lowering our stress also, you know, keeps our blood circulation nice. If we actually clog our blood vessels, like happens as you get older with cardiovascular disease, you actually need to keep you need to kind of help the body grow some more uh, vessels. And it turns out that there are some foods, 
you know, things like apple peels and capers um, uh, that can actually help to support um, angiogenesis. So the and, and on the other hand of the equation, side of the equation is where, the, where tumors can hijack your blood vessel system. So think about, you know, tumors being like, you know, the terrorist that gets into the, get, somehow gets through security and onto the plane. They're trying to get into the cockpit to hijack the plane. That's basically what cancers do to try to hijack our blood supply. Once they're fed, they can grow 16,000 times in size in just a couple of weeks. So we want to, your, our body wants to stop that process in its tracks. That's sort of like the homeland security of our body. You can't allow those terrorists to hijack our blood vessels. And there are foods that can actually help our body do that, like soy and tomatoes and green tea and things like that. Question you asked. So if you're trying to starve a cancer by cutting off its blood supply, are you cutting off the blood supply to your heart? On the other hand, if you're trying to grow blood vessels for your heart, are we feeding the cancer, right? right. That's sort of like the, the two sides meet the middle. Are these worlds going to collide? And the answer is that Mother Nature doesn't allow it to happen. In other words, um, uh, uh, our body has a set point. Um, call it the Goldilocks zone. Not too hot, not too cold, like, mm -hmm. like Goldilocks, where it's impossible to eat foods that will shut down your blood vessels below the baseline. Think about it like a lawnmower over a lawn. You just set the height, it'll mow it down, it'll take anything that pops up over the overage right mm -hmm. back down to where it should be. Same thing as, um, as growing it. You can't overgrow that lawnmower, that mother of nature's lawnmower that keeps us in a state of balance, mows it back down if you actually have too many blood vessels. So you really can't use foods to um, uh, tip over that ship. But food you won't can, allow it. But obviously there are things, like you're saying, cancer or whatever, that does adjust the lawnmower's height whether you want it to or not, so to speak. Right. And that's where foods can come into play because foods can actually help to, that's where foods come into play because yeah. foods can actually help to um, uh, enhance that lawnmower. It's like an extra set of lawnmowers uh, that you're bringing out into the, into the fold. Um, uh, uh, the most important thing I think is, is that, uh, that you're asking about the conflict is that um, we should be eating things that just strengthen our defenses and keep that balance as much as possible. So we want to eat things that grow blood vessels and eat things that mow it back down. And that way the Goldilocks zone is really kind of where we stay uh, in shape all the time. All right. And that makes sense. So like the one thing that I noticed, Marcus, that is different between your two methodologies, Marcus is completely vegan and you seem to be your diets and your suggestion seems to be like 85% vegan so to speak but you do condone like i saw you say chicken thighs are very good for you and oysters are very good for you because of uh was it k12 am i right in that and, and um and like k2. k2 sorry and lycopene and stuff like that so are you for or against a vegan diet or is that a moot point for you because it's more about keeping this body in in good basis so to speak yeah so so first of all I absolutely uh, uh, endorse and, and support uh, plant-based eating. And so vegans uh, actually are doing the right thing. I mean, on the other hand, you know, you can eat uh, vegan, but eat a lot of stuff that's ultra processed. And yeah. so it's not just simply what you're cutting out of your diet. It's sort of how you eat what, you're, what you have in your diet as well. That said, you know, veganism is definitely healthy, but most people who go towards veganism have more than just simply health in mind. There's usually some other overarching philosophies that actually um, uh, make them want to not eat animal uh, products, right. and it's that's more, okay too. It's more ethical. I get that. Um, yeah. I, sorry. So one of the things I noticed when I looked up, when I'm watching your uh, TED Talk, which I think, kudos to you, it's at like 12 million views now. That's pretty cool. Um, on the sidebar, you get recommended videos, right? And it's funny to watch because it's all things like one is about a ketogenic diet. One is about, it's this guy, Dr. Mark Hyman, that has a whole different philosophy. And the one thing that I think is very hard because we're seeing this go on right now with COVID is the same thing that's going on with dietary science, if that's a word. There's so much conflicting information out there that you don't know who to believe or what to believe. And as a general layman, you want to blow your brains out. Why do you think that is? Like, why is there so many doctors with 180s on what they believe in? Well, you know, I mean, I think this, this is because nutrition is such an important con uh, topic for all of us. We all have to eat, you know, um, uh, and, and I think that people are seriously interested in this. 
Now, you know, I really can't speak for other people, but I can tell you that I'm a physician that's been involved 25 years with drug development. So I actually have good street cred when it comes to taking science and going through all the rigorous stuff that's required to develop a product with a good evidence. And so when I got into food, I'll tell you the reason I, I actually got into nutrition, um, besides the fact that I actually enjoy food and I like to cook, is that I used to be a VA doctor, you know, for veterans. And I, I just felt compelled to try to help the people that help, you know, that served our country. And, and uh, many of my patients were, you know, uh, morbidly obese and they were in terrible shape. And I thought there was this gigantic disconnect in my mind when I saw these patients in their 50s and 60s and 70s that when they were in their 20s, they were in cut buff shape, right? You couldn't even get into the military unless you were a perfect physical specimen. Right. So like what me. the heck? Thank you. Okay. What the heck happened over the next 30, 40 years had to be diet and nutrition. And I realized that I was never taught that in medical school or in training. And I felt that was wrong. So I went back to take a look at nutrition and food as medicine. But my lens is not sort of, you know, just the lens of good intention. Um, I think there's a lot of people out there that are um, trying to get on the soapbox who are really trying to talk about what they believe in based on intention. I'm a scientist. So what I talk about, what I wrote in my book, Eat to Beat Disease, is really all based on hardcore science. And, and most many of the people that you see out there are actually coming to me Either they're my friends or they're people that I'm helping to teach what I'm actually doing because I, I think there is a new way that everybody can speak the same common language, and that's understanding how the body responds to what we put inside it. And that's what I wrote about. You, also you know, Ralph, sorry, Marcus. I want to just say I, it's fascinating. I'm really happy to talk to you. I think that um, you, you're saying really enlightened things, and I appreciate that. And, you know, I would say that for me, there's no such thing as hard science. Everything is constantly changing. Um, you're an explorer and also besides being a scientist, I see you as being a philosopher because there has to be a little bit in that. Otherwise, you would just be a computer spitting out data. And so I come from it from a very different perspective, a different background. Think about it from my perspective is that I'm in the food business serving this type of product and I have to be a disruptor, and I have to have knowledge. Otherwise, I am competing with people out there who are prescribing things and saying things. And so what I had to do is inundate myself with information. And the first concept I came up with based on Ralph's question is, why, do, why is there so much confusion in nutrition? And the first thing is, what I realized is, unlike the science of physics, where there's a lot of theories involved and you can put math behind it, the science of nutrition, the person who's teaching it really can only go as far as they've, what they've performed and done on themselves. Otherwise, what they're doing is regurgitating something, even if it came from a peer-reviewed paper, a, a peer-reviewed paper or double-blind studies, they're just regurgitating. It's a, they're using a memory bank. And so if you go to a doctor and say, doctor, I'm thinking about doing a juice fast, and he says, don't do it, and he's never done one, He's going based on what he understands. And he might be right in some cases, a lot of stupid things out there in the nutrition world. But what I wanna say is that what, what I've, the way that I've come to frame nutrition for the layman is two ways. First and foremost is to look at how the earth has provided food for each and every creature specific to our anatomy and our biology. So, it's obvious when you look at a tiger versus a human, you can see that we are not designed to be primarily carnivorous creatures. We're omnivores, if there's such a word. And we're not omnivore ideally. We're omnivore as an adaptation so that if the main food that we need, which is carbohydrates from a plant-based diet, is not available, we don't die. We don't perish. And that's a very, very uh, powerful adaptation that we have. And... Um, I want to just go back to K12 and K2, all those vitamins. My mentor in food taught me something that I found to be true. When there's confusion about a specific nutrient and whether or not it's only available in meat-based products, what my mentor, who's 91 years old and has been 100% raw vegan for 52 years, maybe 53, I think it's changed, and I really respect what he does, um, what he says, if it's not available in the plant kingdom, then the human body doesn't need it. Now, why people become deficient, if you look at it from a scientific perspective, you can just use a reductionist mentality and say, well, 
If you show me a case study of someone who's left out all processed food, they're not eating too much protein, they're getting exercise, they have a generally a positive attitude, they believe in something, and you can still show me that that person has a blood sugar problem or um, you know some food-related illness, they'd be a, it'd be a miraculous case. You'd have to like go closely and study what they're doing because it just doesn't exist. I saw that anecdotally through a decade of dealing with hundreds of thousands of people at Juice Press. Pause. I'm pausing myself. I can go on ranting and raving. Very passionate about the subject, Doctor. Sorry. And also, your your, uh, your internet keeps crapping out, Mark, for some reason. Oh man. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, Doctor, I have other thing. I noticed you said that um, you believe that angiogenesis is linked to seventy different diseases. Is that correct? That's right. Um, first of all, blood vessels connect every organ in our body. So whenever our organs actually have problems, there's almost always a blood vessel connection to it. But actually, the blood vessel, the problems of the blood vessels can actually be one of the primary causes or pro primary responsible for the symptoms of it. Not only cancer, but like if you have your blood vessels going out of control in your eyes, you go blind. Mm -hmm. Macular degeneration, diabetic retinopathy, diabetic blindness. If you don't actually, if you can't heal a wound, whether you cut yourself, scrape yourself, have trauma or surgery, that's actually because you don't have enough blood vessels from growing. And chronic wounds are a gigantic hidden epidemic in our nursing homes and people with diabetes right. and elderly. My so, dad too. He was always bleeding. Like, he could not uh, stop bleeding from my Doc, can I, can I ask you to just say one thing here? I love you. I want you to come on the show all the time. <laughs> I want to write a book with you. <laughs> can you just say, and I'm, I'm asking, that 90% of that shit is diet and lifestyle related. I just need to hear a doctor out there. I'm almost, I feel like you're about to say it somewhere in here. I just want to see if we can get right to that for a second. Right. Well, I mean, it, it is absolutely true that the majority of the chronic diseases that we are suffering from in modern society uh, are preventable through diet and lifestyle. And diet, nutrition, if you want to take a look at great examples, cancer, you know, we always talk about genetics of cancer and gene therapies and all the fancy diagnostic stuff. Well, it turns out only 5 to 10% of all cancers are genetically caused. We're reading the same books, doctor. I, I love you, man. I just got to, I want to give you a big internet hug. Virtual hug, hug virtual hug. I mean, virtual yeah. hug. You got a good one. You got a good one here. We got a good one here. Well, 90 to 95% of cancers are due to our environment and not just what we've exposed ourselves to because just living on planet earth, you know, we got to, our body pays a tax from just being alive, the sunshine, the atmosphere. And then we start throwing <laughs> stuff into the water, you know, and then people start smoking cigarettes and doing all kinds of crazy things. I mean, we take a toll. Our, our planet takes a toll on us, and we extract it from the planet as well. well let me ask, what, if I, what if I clean my cocaine before I use it? Is that better? <laughs> yes. Well, it depends. You know, it depends. Donald Trump, Donald Trump will, has clean get cocaine. I get all the fentanyl out of it. It's clean coal. Before I do it. Um, do you find that your thoughts are being challenged by other, other medical professionals, other people in your community, because there's so much money to be made in, I hate the term, big pharma, but that whole idea that what you're saying is, if people eat right and watch what's going in their body, which Marcus also, also believes, but you're different because you are a doctor, you're speaking out in this in the medical world, you're getting pushback from other contemporaries. You know, uh, remarkably, I'm not. I think partly because I do the real science and I also have been involved with pharmaceuticals. And so I right. helped to develop some of the newest drugs. Mm -hmm. So as it turns out that, you know, people, you know, maybe corporations, you know, uh, as a whole, uh, wish that the tide of progress, you know, might keep back to the old days. But really, the tide of progress is really understanding our lifestyle and food. You know, and food as medicine is a rising movement. And I actually even challenge that term, food as medicine, because food isn't medicine. Hallelujah. There's somebody out there I can talk to. It's finally, a, a man worth... A man worth you get Pulitzer Prize coming. I'm going to call yeah. up the uh, noble guys in Where are Pulitzer? they? You're going to call Stevie Pulitzer and make it happen? It's so amazing to find you to hear a MD say this shit, man. Wow. Well, it must be true. You just dropped something. Um, you're one of the rare ones because you're riding the line between food, health, and science, where I feel that a lot of people that go under the, the scientist or the MD heading don't want to embrace it as much. Maybe I'm just crazy. He, he's, he's a genius because what he's doing is what I like. I'm not saying I'm smart. Someone taught me how to do this. He's, he's being literal. It's when you, when you think about science 
and the difference between one word or the other or a technical manual and you say the wrong word, you explain the process wrong. You can't really say food is medicine. What you can say is food is spare parts and food is the energy your body needs to do what it's naturally designed to do. So when people say, let food be thy medicine, they get a little confused because it's a, there's a little mythology behind that as opposed to saying the right way we say it in New York, if you get the fuck out of the way, your body oh. knows exactly what to do and what is getting in your way. It's all the shit and the garbage that we eat. Right, but yeah, it's all the Dr. lifestyle. Lee, that you can't really say that in a medical book, right? It might be an interesting medical book. <laughs> Dr. Lee, you also are involved with creating medicines though. So that almost goes against that a little bit though. Well, not really, because you know, I mean there are there are um, bona fide reasons that the right people getting the right medicines at the right time uh, will benefit from them. And so, you know, that's part of my street cred is like, you know, I'm, I'm a real practicing uh, doctor who is not afraid to use the most advanced tools. I will tell you, though, that, you know, and, and I think, uh, Marcus, you'll probably uh, dig this, is that food is really a, a tool in the toolbox when it comes to health medicines are another tool but all we've had are the tools of medicine and that's what people lug around it's kind of like you know like a like a carpenter that only walks around only with hammers everything looks like a nail and that's everything all you want to do is like basically like pound nails in with your hand well, medicine medicine is as old as mankind so it really it's just a relative term again the medicine they had three thousand years ago in egypt it might not be as you know, brilliant as the medicines we have today. Medicine is really just intervention yeah. when the body's natural pathway to recovery is closed. And I studied history of science and I can tell you, medicine has become industrialized, which didn't exist hundreds of years ago or thousands of years ago. And the medicines back then were mostly plant-based. Most of it some of actually came work. from plants, and, and, <laughs> and some of them didn't work. Well, you know, uh, the thing is, you know this, the way I describe the, the plant-based medicines that haven't been processed is the same thing as when you go and you buy like a really super all-natural floor cleaner versus the industrial nasty stuff that has a skull and crossbone on it. Something that's been processed and is highly concentrated and has been manipulated, obviously, might clean faster, but at the same time, it's taking you know the it's skin off your, your eyebrows face. off in the process. Yeah. yeah. Um, let me ask you this, because you've now been in this world of food is medicine or food is part of the toolbox. If you want to use the right word there, at least for seven years. So that the the video is seven years old, right? So at least that long, maybe I'm sure longer. Um, are there food like methodologies or things that you believed in that were helpful a decade ago? that now you feel that you've learned better and those foods that you thought were good, you know more now and you don't recommend them as much. Like you recommend cheese and beer, which was surprising to me. I'm curious if all the things on your list are still on your list. Do you know, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, so I, I'll, I'll tell you. Um, I, think, uh, I think Marcus said it pretty well, uh, which is that science changes. And it's a, I, I actually hadn't really heard anybody describe it that way, which is that hard science implies rigid, you know, right. kind of unchanging science. But in fact, it really is morphing. It's kind of like a blob that keeps on, Yeah, you know, I wish all, of, all scientists would always say it's what we know now, not what we know, because what we know now may change. But when you say what we believe, what we know, it, it gives the wrong idea. Well, and also what I've actually built my career on is really being at really the frontiers at the borderline of what's known uh, what's not yet known versus what's known. And I'm somebody that really believes in pushing that envelope to keeping on knowing more. So, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll share with you some interesting uh, data that's just come out just in the last week, if you want to talk about sort of like change. Right. Yeah. Uh, there was a paper published last week that actually showed that as we get older, our body doesn't process proteins in the same way, particularly animal proteins. And we accumulate a byproduct of the menu of the breakdown of proteins called methylmalonic acid. And guess what? That this, this study, which is just a week old, actually shows that methylmalonic acid actually uh, 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 pulls the trigger in cancer cells to make them grow faster and spread oh. harder. And so the, the bottom line is like, I mean, this is a week old. Like, you know, most scientists, most oncologists haven't heard, even heard about this yet because it's really in the ether you know, that, that they're thin air of research. But now you guys are hearing it and your viewers are going to be hearing this. This is actually how, um, how science changes. So I'm, 
actually mostly I'm recommended I'm talking based about that for 15 years. I, I, I'm talking about how the byproduct of animal protein in particular or too much protein doesn't, when you get down to the nitty gritty, it doesn't make a difference what the source is. The byproduct are nitrogenous gases. And with animal protein in particular, the byproduct gases, your normal healthy cells cannot thrive because they can only thrive in a highly oxygenated environment. Whereas a cancer cell is mutated. Besides having more insulin receptors, it can also thrive in an environment that's not rich in oxygen. So it has an unfair advantage. In a, sim in a similar situation, when I had too much protein, my ex-girlfriend broke up with me for my byproduct gases. <laughs> I knew he was going to struggle to get over a joke. I had to give him some runway with that one. I made it work, I feel. Um, you know, I mean, for, first of all, I'd like to ask you, doctor, are you at all friendly or acquainted with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Mechanic? Uh, I know the name, but I don't know him. He's out here in New York, and he's, um, he's an endocrinologist, and he's on my board of uh, advisors for this company I have, Good Sugar, and I've known him for a few years. He wrote two books on molecular nutrition, which are for industry people. They're not for, for the layman because it gets really, uh, gets really deep into it. And it's really funny how our language, he gets the science language. I say it like a street fighter. And the things that I've been saying for years, I'd say about 75% of it is just digested material that because I read a lot. I read science books. I like the Merck Medical Journal, one of my favorite books. I always look at it. Um, twenty-five percent of its experience, you know, just anecdotal experience, uh, helping uh, ten type one diabetic people make a shift, not get off insulin, but just watching very anecdotally that if you reduce, if you take out things from their diet, how profound and immediate the changes are. You don't really need anything else. You, in fact, there's a kid I'm working with today, who's a friend of mine. For 20 years, he has chronic stomach pain. He's been to every doctor where he lives in Maryland, and no one has a solution. I said, look, I'm not a doctor. I'm going to send you seven bottles of this really, really amazing plant-based probiotic. Just take five times the normal dosage. Don't change anything else in your diet. Don't change your attitude. Don't add exercise. Don't break up. Don't get involved with a relationship. Just keep everything the same. A week after starting this treatment, he said, it's the first time in 20 years he doesn't feel pain. And I said to him, well, now we got to do another experiment because I want to see if it's a, a placebo effect because I, mean, I believe it I works. I'd get the same reaction from him if I sent him heroin. He also wouldn't feel pain. Well, so. that's great. So, so I'm, I'm conducting a very, 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 as you can see, a very broad anecdotal yeah. experiment. Oh, we lost him right on that word. He's okay, because really Jeffrey does, by the way. Jeffrey is the most medical guy I've ever met in my life. You can't get, if I say the word homeopathic, he'll attack me for 30 minutes. There's no <laughs> such word. It doesn't exist. Um, so, so I think that you would agree with everything that I'm saying. And I'm so happy because I feel so alone out here talking about nutrition in the way that I do. Uh, there's Dr. three Lee or four guys you can talk to. Dr. Lee, is there a diet that you've, I hate the word diet, but is there like a meal plan that you follow on a daily basis that you believe is the most uh, angiogenic, like positive meal plan? Yeah, so listen, uh, I, I thought about this when I wrote my book, and uh, I, I, I present a way, a meal plan, uh, a, an approach to diet that um, I think works for almost everybody. I call it the five by five by five system. You've got five health defense systems, angiogenesis, your body stem cells, your microbiome, gut health, uh, DNA protection, and immunity. And these are systems that if they're firing on all cylinders properly and fed properly, they will actually keep us healthy. So if you've got five systems, you eat one thing every day to actually feed one of those systems. And on average, we encounter food about five times a day, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and a couple of snacks, then you're actually all set. And I believe in sort of a mixed martial arts approach um, uh, to, to healthy eating, which is that, you know, you got to have situation. Well, you got to have situational awareness. You got to be well trained. You got your head, your head in the right space. And you got to be willing to use whatever style you're up against in order to be able to actually uh, uh, to win. Uh, and this is really about life and navigating the cage, right? Do, so, you, use, do you use astrology sometimes? And uh, well. <laughs> 
Astronomy. You can look up the, no, look up the stars. Only, he only eats blueberries when Mercury is rising. Yeah. You know, right. you know, if you really observe that stuff, as moronic as it is, it's in the Merck Medical, Medical Journal, and they're right, and it's classic knowledge, is that when a person has a system of beliefs and they really believe that they're doing good, it will have a positive impact on their chemistry in some way. And so that stuff is ridiculous for you, Ralph. But when you think about it, we're doing ridiculous stuff every day. I mean, some of the things that we do in the modern world, they're as ridiculous as the thing, you know, wearing crystals and putting crystals in your water. But the behavior that we have in society, it's only not ridiculous because it's normalized and we believe in it. Right. Well, of course, like when you look at, uh, not to get off topic here, when you look at the Christianity religion or the Jewish religion, how if you look at it as an outsider, it's as crazy as Scientology, but because Scientology is newer, people like to make fun of it more. But you I just want to, I just want to warn the, the um, listener, we're in no way uh, talking down on any of the big religions. You want to believe. But listen, you said five <laughs> by five by five, the five uh, ways to protect your body, the five meals of the day. What's the last five? Oh, so just eat one food every day, at least, that actually activates one of those five health defenses. So you get oh, yeah. at least five opportunities to pick something that's going to feed each of those five systems. It's kind of like, you know, like uh, uh, sticking something into each of the five uh, 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 kind of spaces uh, that, that help your body. You can eat more if you like. Sounds like you were describing my last orgy. So, do you, Doc, do you, um, do, you have, do you have your book handy? Uh, do I have? Yeah, I do. Absolutely. Can you just hold it up? Because we have a YouTube. This goes directly to YouTube. Disease. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful gonna, cover. Uh, Congratulations. Can I see yeah. how many pages it is? Oh, uh, let's see. I'll, 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 you want to see how thick it is? Oh, hang on. Now, how many pages okay. you got there? I got it. He's really describing I, I got. Uh, I got four hundred and sixty-five pages. All right. That's, thank that, God. You know what? I got to tell thank you. I'm going to promote the shit out of your have. book. Uh, let me ask you a couple of quick closing questions. Um, I also heard you sort of endorse. The Impossible Burger or Beyond Meat Burger, which I find weird because I feel that it's worse for you, maybe I'm crazy, than just having a regular meat burger. If you're talking about the health of it all, a really good high quality meat seems better to me than this processed nonsense that is in those burgers. Let me, let me give it to you straight. First of all, I am not endorsing Impossible or Beyond <laughs> or any of these other processed foods. Like you kind of foods. said something that seemed like... Well, well, I, well, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll tell you what I what I do say. I say that plant based foods trump meat any day of the week, twenty four seven, three sixty five. That is actually what you should be eating most of the time. What you shouldn't be eating are highly ultra processed foods. And for better or worse, you know, people who are well intentioned will say, "Well, let's not try to." do the meat thing, but let's make it taste exactly like meat. And let's try to make plants taste like meat. And let's process that. If you take a look at the ingredients, you know, I, I've actually sampled both because I was mm -hmm. curious. Um, uh, and then I asked them to bring out the label so I could see what was in it. And I can tell you that that label was not nice to look at. Um, no. And That's if you're, you know, surprised. and some of them are, you know, like if, if you're, if you have any qualms about GMO, I mean, one of those burgers actually is actually genetically modified to, to look like it's bleeding, oh, you know? Yeah. So, so it's sort of like, this is like a stunt double, you know, uh, on a, on a Hollywood film, uh, for plant-based food, just to eat the real plant. And then, you know, for the people that, you know, are real, just really love a burger, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty non-judgmental, right? So everybody's different. And some people just really like to eat stuff that doesn't, isn't good for them. Uh, what I say is that, you know, you should absolutely eat good stuff for you most of the time, all the time if you can. But if you can't help yourself and you have to have a burger, don't go for like the fake burger that's ultra processed. Yeah. Just eat, just eat a, a really that's good right. one yeah. and, and don't do it too often. You know, so. Yeah, that's the better way to, I agree with that wholeheartedly. So now last couple of things. I just one, want to say something about those kind of burgers. You know, <clears throat> I look at those ingredients and here's how I think about it. You know, is methadone worse than heroin? I don't know, you know. Uh, there's all kinds of things. There's all kinds of get off of your meat stuff. I mean, I don't, I don't, I, I look at that stuff and I say, you're going to, you're going to fry it on a grill in oil. You're going to bring the temperature too high. So it's a carcinogenic, no matter what you do, you're probably going to eat it with a condiment that 
has lots of refined and processed sugar in it. You're probably going to eat it on a bread that's also processed flour. You're probably going to eat it with something that has some kind of French fry. You might even have it with a soda. So not to be judgmental, we're just talking strictly science. Your body is going to react to it. It's so convincingly meat. Your body is going to produce the same digestive acids and enzymes to break it down. Your body is going to have the same uh, shift in your uh, pH balances. You're going to have to work to restore homeostasis. And, uh, you know, like what are you really accomplishing except possibly saving animals, which is really important. Um, that, that would probably be the biggest defense for those type of foods is that they're compassionate and they're probably going to have less of a global impact on what we're doing to the planet. Right, get, because yeah, but of, then I think you're getting off to that. That's a different uh, argument well, entirely, but I agree with you. So then the last couple of things is I know you too are big supporters of yours, right? And I've seen Bono say things about you and I think you did something with The Edge as well. Who reached out? They just reached out to you one day? Like how did that come about? Well, I, you know, I've actually had a pretty interesting career because I work on the uh, sort of real frontiers of medical research. Um, you know, uh, people who are activists who really want to know how can we do better? I mean, that's really what the activism is all about, is wanting to do better than and not accepting what, what's out there today, wanting to kind of reach for that next thing and make it happen. And so both, um, uh, I mean, I met Edge first. He, um, and this is uh, widely known, he had a daughter who was sick and he asked me to you know, weigh in and see if I can be helpful. And, and she's doing really well right now. Um, uh, and, and I discovered that that he and I both share a love of science and he um, has a scientist's brain. And I basically also play piano. So I have a musician's uh, fingers. And so it's sort of like science, music, science, music. It just was like a, a natural uh, kind of connection that we actually had. And then through him, I got to meet um, Bono and other people Isn't as there well. Is a foundation that combines science and music? Am I crazy? I think I saw ads for that once. There is some foundation that brings science and music together. I forget what it is, but there is. Well, something. you know, I, I don't know about that, but I, but I actually combine in my foundation, my nonprofit, the Andrew Genesis Foundation, we always try to take sort of science and creativity and really try to blend and weave those things together because that's really the only way to actually um, – be able to think differently. Otherwise, you're just repeating what everybody else is doing. By the way, it sounds like a terrible album. I hope you don't put it out. That's all I'm going to say. The Andrew, <laughs> Andrew Genesis album. Okay. So now I actually like that name. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, you've been on a Good Morning America, CNN, CNBC, The Doctor Ross Show, and so many others. Can we all agree that we were more enjoyable than any of those shows? <laughs> well, I, you know, I definitely heard the word heroin more than, <laughs> than, than, than <laughs> any of the other shows I've done. But uh, no, I mean, listen, I, I'm very um, it's great to have a conversation with people who just have like plain talk about things that people can relate to and understand. Um, and, uh, yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I've really enjoyed our conversation. Yeah, the new, the book is called eat to be disease. Uh, the Ted talk is, can we eat to starve cancer? Dr. William Lee.com. As we said earlier, the medical director of the angiogenesis foundation. Thank you so much for taking the time out. Thanks, Ralph. Thanks, Marcus. Nice to meet Thank you, you. And you. Thanks for having me. Uh, thank you so much. I thought he was a really uh, interesting dude, Marcus. I liked him and more than I thought I would. And I felt also you guys seem to be right in line with each other. I'm, you know what? I am, I am humbled by a guy like that because those are the types of guys that I look like, that I, I'm sorry, that I look for because I know that just by sitting with them for a couple hours, I'm going to increase my knowledge base and feel more confident saying certain things. And also, I really love to have someone to go to when someone presents me with a problem. And mm -hmm. I've only had two people to do that in my, uh, in my effort, in my work, me. in the food business. Well, <clears throat> besides you, um, Frank, I go, there's a homeless yeah, guy. Yeah. I think he, he's <laughs> great because he, he only eats canned sardines, so he has a lot of knowledge. Very no, I, I, I go to uh, Jeffrey Mechanic, MD, and I go to Fred Bishi, who's right. uh, my mentor with food. And, uh, you know, it's great to add someone else to the arsenal. Uh, so really quickly, uh, the show has been doing better and better. Uh, we thank all of you that are sharing it to other people. And uh, I heard we're big in Switzerland we're now. We're big in Switzerland. For some reason, we hit the charts. Brian, do you know where we were in the charts exactly in Switzerland? And he's not there. Yeah, we were 88. 88 in the chart. Wow. Number 88 in the charts. Wow. 88 in health wellness or 88 overall? 
uh, just in health and wellness. Right, I'll take it. I'm so happy with that. That's, That's a good. very big. Listen, I don't. I hope there's more than 88 podcasts because <laughs> I, I would imagine no. there's more than 88 podcasts. It's not just Swiss related podcasts. It's of all podcasts. Uh, if you have a health or wellness or fitness or something expert you'd like us to speak with, you can always DM me at I am Ralph Sutton or email 5000 at goodsugar.life. Follow me everywhere at I am Ralph Sutton. Leave us a review. Give us a five-star review if you want. If not, go ahead, whatever you want to do. But uh, thank you for being a part of it. Marcus, any closing words? Thank you for that wonderful guest. All right. We'll see you next week on Good Sugar. Peace. <laughs>